There's a story that my mom tells, I don't remember this because I was too young. I think I was two years old. And she had me in a stroller in the grocery store. She said there was like this group of teenage kind of ish boys. And they were like, your little girl is so pretty. She looks like Madonna. Who at the time was a full grown, very sexual woman. And my mom's like, this is a two year old. But I feel like it's emblematic at a very young age being given some strange attention that there's no way that I could comprehend or ask for and even process. And then that just continued the older that I got. And so how does that affect your view of men? <laughs> it's a complicated question. This, I, whole, this whole conversation is complicated. <laughs> Today, we're talking about a book that changed somebody's life. Once they read this book, they were never the same. We have a very special guest, Jackie Gerard. She is a licensed marriage and family therapist. She has her own podcast. She's many things, one of which is incredibly fun to talk to and smart, somebody I could talk to all day. The book that she chose is Blonde by Joyce Carol Oates. What is your, your process? Like, do you have a time of day you read, or like a certain ritual? I guess I tend to read at night at this point, like before bed, which is good because it helps you get off your phone before bed, which, you know, the blue light is bad for us. So I try to go to bed, read a few pages. Some people get sleepy when they read and it kind of puts them to sleep to read. So maybe reading in bed, they don't get very far. But for me, it doesn't. I can stay awake pretty long reading and sometimes... So how long, long, like how long will you go? <laughs> At this point, I don't know, maybe 30, 40 minutes of reading. And then I do get tired because I'm trying to go to bed. But <laughs> I love reading in bed because it feels cozy and it feels personal. What are a few of the books that you always kind of go back to and reread? Oh, my gosh. Okay, so there, <laughs> there's this one. Well, it's not fair to answer this way because it's called House of Leaves. And it's sort of a really long experimental kind of horror novel that's kind of a love story in disguise. And Choose your own adventure? A little bit. There's a little bit of that. There's two narrators. There's a whole frame story, and they're kind of being told simultaneously. Anyways, and it's really scary and complex. And I've tried to read that again several times, and I haven't been able to get through it because it's really hard and it's scary. But I did read it all the way through the first time. So that's one that I go back to a lot, even though I don't think I ever finished reading it for a second time. The Little Prince is another one that I read all the time, every once a year. The Great Gatsby, I probably read once a year. Yeah, those are definitely ones that I go back to. Wow, and you've been doing that like for a long time? Mm -hmm. Rereading yeah, them? for always, yeah. The Little Prince I read since I was a kid and I still go back and read it like almost every year, so. That's what I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to read. I haven't read it. And it keeps coming up now. It's very good. It's very good. Kind of like The Alchemist for a while. Like people just kept mentioning oh, yeah. it and mentioning yeah, it. Yeah, and then yeah. it hit me at the right time. So Blonde. Blonde. Yeah. <laughs> kind of where were you in life when that book came into the picture? It was actually kind of hard for me to remember the answer to this because the book came out in, I think, 2000, and I didn't get it right away. I'm, I'm a huge fan of Joyce Carol Oates, who is the author of this novel. She's an extremely prolific writer. She is, in my opinion, the greatest living American author today. So I didn't stumble across it until years after it came out. So I want to say it was maybe 2006, 2007. I do remember buying it in a used bookstore in my hometown. And I was there with my two daughters and they were pretty young at the time. I was a young mother at the time. Yeah, two little kids, like three and one years old. Um, maybe I was like 25 or so. So I was young, you know, and I love her. I love everything Joyce Carol Oates writes. And this book is a fictionalized biography of Marilyn Monroe. Now, when you buy the book, are you more excited that she wrote it or that it's about Marilyn? I think just anything that Joyce Carol Oates writes, I will buy, I will read voraciously. I can't say I've read everything she's ever written because she's written hundreds of novels and short stories. Um, 
but I've read almost everything, anything I could get my hands wow. on. So it was really her that led me to Blonde. And it just happened to be that was what she wrote about for that book, you know? But I was very excited to read anything that she wrote. So what is life like having a three-year-old and a one-year-old as a mom? It's, um, <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. And I was young. I was pretty young at the time. And you're alone, but you're with these two little people all the time too. And even if I was married at the time, you know, and it doesn't matter, you're still alone. I was a stay-at-home mom with these kids and it's wonderful. I love my daughters. I loved raising them and being home with them, but you kind of start to feel like you're not a whole person anymore and you just become this mother. And I didn't want to just become a mother. I wanted to still be a whole person. And I think through literature and specifically Blonde, it touches on so many themes of what it means to be a woman and what you have to do to be a woman. And I didn't know that when I picked it up at the time that I picked it up. But as I read through it, I mean, it's already like emotional to me, just like connecting this stuff and remembering the themes of this book. It's really, really profound. So when, when you feel alone like that, are you feeling alone because you're serving others to a degree that you don't ever feel like you matter or that you're serving yourself because you got kids that are unpredictable and then you have a husband? Like explain that feeling to me, like what it is in looking back. You sort of become invisible you're there, these people, especially the children, are really relying on you and they need you desperately, like literally for survival. And you're doing for them and you want to do that, but hardly anyone is doing anything for you. And hopefully it would include a husband taking care of his wife in certain ways during that time, but it doesn't always. And it's not always his fault and, you know, whatever, maybe that's a whole other story. But you just start to feel like you are a function, that you're mm. not a person anymore. And it's, and it's routine. Very routine. And you're right, though, there is sort of this unpredictability or chaos that is also built into this really kind of boring, mundane routine that you end up in every day. So it's kind of this combination of every day is the same, but then all this different stuff happens every day and you don't know what's going to happen or who's going to have a mood or a tantrum, you know, and you're always trying to catch up and keep up with that. And like whatever's going on with yourself, you just don't even know hardly. And so one of the things that you do have is you have the escape into a book. Yes. And so that's personal. Yes. It's, it's about you in a sense, and you're going on a journey or escaping into it one way or the other. Yeah. So when you get blonde, you're excited about the author, mm -hmm. but then what, what's the first memory you have when you started reading it? The, and, and I give Joyce Carol Oates so much credit for being able to do this, not just with this work, but so much of her work. It's like immediately you are immersed in the psychology of this character. And in the case of Blonde, the character is Norma Jean Baker, who is the given name of Marilyn Monroe, who becomes Marilyn Monroe later. And the way that she writes, um, you're just inside her mind. And you're inside of Maryland's mind. Yes. So you become Maryland. You're escaping into Maryland. Yes. Yes. And it's not glamorous and beautiful. It's confusing and it's tumultuous because Norma is confused about who she is. And she's objectified and sexualized and she doesn't understand why she doesn't feel that way inside herself a lot of the time. And so there's this conflict that she's experiencing that I think ends up reflecting, yes, where I was kind of at that time with this kind of mother role and not feeling like I was a whole woman or a whole person. But I think just the experience of being a woman in the world, it can be really hard to define yourself for yourself and not be defined by roles, by other people, by the male gaze, by objectification, patriarchy, you know, all of that. 
And I don't think we want to think about that every day because it's really daunting. But this novel highlights all of that through telling the story of this really famous person. We all know who she is. There's iconic imagery belonging to Marilyn Monroe. And yet, that's like a snap shot. That's like a photo of a sex symbol. It's not who she was. How did you relate to that at the time? Is it the, the objectification? Mm -hmm. Or what, what is it specifically that got you? Yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely part of it. The novel really seeks to explore Norma's interior world while she is experiencing this external kind of escalation of fame and celebrity and things like that. And her internal world is um, poetic and spiritual and beautiful and nobody cares <laughs> that it's there. They see her beauty, they see her on the outside and that's what they want her to be. And so I think really relating to that experience of having the internal world of who I am not really noticed. And that doesn't just include this experience of motherhood or young motherhood. It's kind of throughout the development of being a girl, being socialized female, becoming a woman, and being objectified at a very young age when you don't have any sense of who you are anyways. And then you're sort of treated in weird ways because of how you look or how somebody thinks you can fulfill something for them. Being a guy, help me understand this. So <laughs> when, you're, when you're an attractive female, mm -hmm. things also come easier for you. Okay, I want to myth bust that for a second. I think that is the perception. And that has ne never been my personal experience. I don't think I've gotten much of anything that I feel proud of because someone else thought I was pretty. So then what, what is it that happens? What, I mean, is it you're, what is it you're getting from being pretty? I think, and especially the younger that you are when this starts to happen, you get a sense that it doesn't matter who you are. You get a sense that your value is in something external. And it's very confusing. And I mean, I'm talking about, for me, going back to being very young. There's a story that my mom tells. I don't remember this because I was too young. I think I was two years old. And she had me in a stroller in the grocery store. And she said there was like this group of teenage kind of ish boys. And they kept like looking down the aisle or something. And my mom finally said, like, what are you guys doing? What are you looking at? And they were like, your little girl is so pretty. She looks like Madonna, like the singer, who at the time was, you know, a full grown, very sexual woman. And my mom's like, this is a two year old. Like she, my mom was so freaked out by it. And I don't remember that story, but it's sort of an iconic story. Like I don't remember it happening, but I feel like it's emblematic of at a very young age being given some strange attention that there's no way that I could comprehend or ask for and even process. And then that just continued the older that I got. And so how does that affect your view of men then? Um, it's a complicated question. This, I, whole, this whole conversation is complicated. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're an fair. expert in this. No, I mean, and to some degree, I guess I am. I mean, I do um, as for a living. I'm a therapist and I specialize in sex therapy, which has a lot to do with sexuality, presentation, um, all of this stuff. So, no, you're kind of right. But it's funny because when I think about it's hard to my to own detach. personal experience. Yeah. yeah, I'm just like, oh, my God. Yeah. But um, no, I think how does this affect my? Well, how, how did you explain it to your daughters? Oh, that's a great question. I think there's there is an interesting dynamic here with this book where that was a time yes. that was different than when your daughters, well, even different than when you grew up, mm -hmm. different than when your daughters grew up and then different than now. And is it really that different? I think and hope that some things are different. And I can use both of their experiences as a way to kind of see that things are different. I think my daughters are, they're beautiful, they're tall, they're pretty, they're everything, you know, on the outside that, you know, 
whatever would be objectified, right? But I think they've experienced a lot less of this than I did. And I probably experienced less of it than my grandmother and or in a different way, you know, or at the time that like Norma Jean was growing up who became Marilyn Monroe, you know, women were definitely not given equal status in society. And it's much more so now that women can be equal in society. <laughs> I even hate saying it that way because it makes it sound like I've had to wait for permission for that. And I don't think that any human should have to wait for permission, you know? Yeah, that's. I think that's a complicated thing too because when people say equal, I don't really know exactly what that means in a sense because mm -hmm. there still are a lot of things that men are going to do more like just even interests or the yeah. kind of jobs that you would be attracted to or it's an odd thing to pretend like we're the same well and i definitely don't think that men and women are the same and, and so then equal <laughs> means what in that scenario right so i often say like in when i'm being a therapist in my job to if i'm seeing a couple that it's not as important that a couple divides tasks and finances like on paper, penny to penny, down to the letter equally. It's important that it feels equal to both of them, that they both feel like they're in a role that's fulfilling, that gives them something back that isn't just them giving out. Okay, so then let's, can we go back to the kids for a second? Yeah. So you have a husband that's working. Then, at the time, yes. And you are a mom that's raising kids. Yes. Which role is more important? I think they're equally important. There's there's no way. There's no mean? way that raising the kids isn't the most important role. Well, you can't raise kids with zero money because we live under capitalism. No, so. I'm saying like <laughs> just that. as far as the impact on the future, the impact on the overall world, yeah. the impact on two humans that are being developed. There's no there there aren't too many jobs that would come close to that in a sense. See, it's so interesting because I think the way that primary parents or stay-at-home parents specifically feel, they don't feel valued at all. Well, how and you feel and what is true are two different things. No, that is true. Because you could be doing something that's of more value and you could feel like it's not valuable. But just back to my point, yeah. to me, and if you disagree, please tell me, the raising of the kids is way more important than any job I could ever do. I mean, I'm not going to disagree with that, but, but I But the also, way that you feel when you're doing that yes. is that the other thing is maybe more important or even to think that they're equal because they're not, to me, they're not even equal. I think that it is fascinating how, and it's not just my experience, it's the experience of so many and it's usually women who are taking care of the kids more primarily, right? The experience of so many women in that role feeling undervalued, feeling um, just disregarded, feeling unimportant. And yet I do think you're right that there is no more important role. But then how come like as a society, you're the doctor. I'm so many you. women <laughs> are ending up feeling this way, you know? I was raised by a single mom. So to me, I mean, that role always falls on the mom my dad wasn't trying to raise me he wasn't yeah you know he was gone mm -hmm. having more kids somewhere else like mm -hmm. well that had to feel cool for you <laughs> to know that <laughs> but i was lucky to have her like Definitely. some people don't have that even right like mm -hmm. in a sense marilyn didn't even have that no so and, and yeah going back to the book she didn't have a father figure one of the really uh, strong themes in the book is how she is longing for this paternal figure in her life. And, you know, you could kind of make that, um, what I really hate, the terminology of like daddy issues connection of, right? Like she sexualized herself, trying to attract the attention of men because she didn't have a father. But I think that's really reductionist. I feel like she was literally searching for her father and she was objectified by men which maybe she did allow to some extent because she was searching for something. But how is that her fault? I feel like it's her circumstances. And to blame her and say, you know, something like she did that to herself or what have you, you know, I just think that's not fair. Because her dad's the one that was absent, you know? He's the one that wasn't there. So it's his fault. 
So then what about a relationship with her mom in the book? You have to forgive me a little bit because I haven't read it in a while and I did not go to like historically fact check, but I think her mom dies when she's fairly young. So she doesn't really have the presence of her mother either. And her grandmother largely raises her. Oh, that's what it is. Doesn't her mom not allow her to be adopted? There's a lot of complicated. And then we're getting into like the difference between kind of what's in the fictionalized novel that was written and like historical fact of what actually happened in her life, which is not, this is not a historical document. It's a fictionalized, it's a novel version. So it is based on reality, but it's not depicting like history per se, you know? And doesn't she move time around a little bit? She gives a disclaimer at the beginning of the novel, like, yes, this is based on historical events as they happen, but, you Don't know. Don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. Yeah, kind of exactly. It's like kind of combining things and to making it a better, yeah, a better narrative. Going back, Norma Jean, if I'm remembering correctly, she was mainly raised by her grandmother because I think her mom had a drug problem or something like that. Her mom wasn't really present, but she was kind of in and out. And then her grandmother was ill and things like this. She did end up going into kind of like foster care type of homes for a while and stuff like that. So she definitely did not have a consistent, nurturing, reliable upbringing with any parent. Did, did any of that make you think about your daughters? Well, yeah, I mean, I think I did I think I did better than that for them. You know, it was really important to me to be a good mom and not because that should be the only measure of who I am as a woman or a person, but because I did have these kids and nobody made me do it. Like I did it, you know, that was me. So, um, and I tell them, please grow up and be better than me. You know, I wanted to be better than my mom. And I think that I did better than her. I think she did better than her mom too. You know, I think we're all sort of charged to grow and we have to let ourselves, let the generation underneath grow too. So how else did you see yourself in Norma Jean? Oh my gosh. I just, yeah. But I really just relate to the idea that there's a private world. And, and I'm not saying this is only women, but this book is about a woman and I'm a woman, you know? I think men have a complicated time growing up in the world too, you know? I think society gives a lot of messaging to boys and men that is unhelpful. Um, you know, the patriarchy is bad for everybody, not just women, you know? That being said, I think the idea that anybody has a rich, private, interior life and landscape that is not seen and acknowledged externally. I just think that's fascinating. How do you encourage people to express that? Yeah, I think that is important. I think, and sort of, you know, again, as a therapist, that's part of what I'm trying to help people do is to become a more fully expressed, authentic version of themselves. And you have to unlearn a lot of what has been internalized from our culture and our culture being, you know, patriarchal, puritanical, sex negative, um, capitalist, colonialist, you know, all of these, these systems that exist that we can't dismantle independently. But I think we can look at ourselves and dismantle it within ourselves so that we can be more free, so that we can live in a way that's authentic, that we're having a full human experience and not like disowning the vulnerability that we have just to get by, you know? In my research of the book, Marilyn says something to the effect or her kind of view on things was that the attention of a man is what makes you valuable mm -hmm. in a sense. And I'm not quoting it correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's okay. Is that part of it is that learning how to be valuable without somebody else's energy yeah. or permission or whatever it is from the outside, but internalizing that power? Definitely. I think that every human of any gender needs to do that. And whether it's the approval of your parent or the validation from a man, you're here, you're valid, you're on this earth. I don't know why we're all here. I don't know why, you know, but it's your job to figure it out for yourself. And I don't think anyone should get to tell you how to do that. Are there steps that you took or that you would advise people to take oh my to... <laughs> no, that's a tough question too. I think a lot of times, and I think I guess say this for myself personally, there's so many things about myself that I, I knew, even like a young age or like teenage age, I knew and I was terrified of. 
I was like, oh, I can't be like that. It's wrong to be like that. Like what? To like be overtly sexual, not for someone else, but for myself. To get a tattoo because I wanted to, even if everybody that I knew was like, don't do that. The ability to really know inside yourself, I don't care if everyone disagrees, this is what I want to do. And yeah, I feel like now I'm sort of living in that space, but I did not live in that space, you know, because I didn't think that I could. Because I thought that if I did, everybody would leave me. Everybody would hate me. I would be a, literally alone in the world. That's terrifying, especially the younger you are. And we're, we're all kind of seeking some sort of acceptance or belonging. Yeah, and I think it's a paradox because as much as I think we do need to live in a full, authentic way, we also do need community and we need support and we need other people, you know? So it's kind of being able to have the balance of those two things where like that cliche, like bloom where you're planted, right? You're not a seed, like you can move. And sometimes wherever you're planted is not the place where they're gonna let you bloom. And I don't think you have to stay there if that's the case. You have to surround yourself intentionally with people who will accept you, who want you to be your full self, who don't just want you to be what they want you to be. And I think that is what we see like with the unfolding of the story of Marilyn in Blonde, was that she couldn't get out from under this idea that what everyone else wanted her to be. And she became that. She became the sex symbol, the movie star, the all of this. And there was this other part of her that just never really got what it needed. What was that other part? She really just truly wanted to be loved and not adored like by fans in this impersonal, objectified way, but just truly loved for her fears, for her anxiety, for her flaws. And I don't know that she ever got that. Is that a, uh, a noble pursuit to want to be loved for all your flaws and... I think we all want to be loved, even with our flaws. But don't we all kind of understand that to be loved, you have to be lovable? You have to give something also? It isn't... I mean, I know we like to think it is, but it's not an unconditional thing. No, I agree. To, be a to have a friend, you have to be a friend. And so... Well, yeah, and I think that's why it goes back to like developing yourself and your sense of who you are first is always going to be the way you get anything that you want. Because if you become the kind of person, Freud had this idea that everybody was bad and had to be like trained to be good by society or whatever. And it's funny because I'm not some optimistic type of person. Like I'm a, I'm a pretty dark person, honestly, you know, but I have learned to have more hope in the sense that I think people are born with endless potential. I think people are born good. And I think that everyone wants to be good and not good in the way that society tells you, oh, in order to be good, you have to be quiet and compliant. I mean, feel good, be good, like be able to say, I'm a good person, I like who I am. And if you can be in that place and you can say that, then I think, yeah, people will respond to that. You will be able to be loved for who you are. It's definitely not <laughs> an excuse when people say, oh, brutal honesty, this is just who I am and you have to deal with it. I don't think that's right either. I think that's very defensive and that's probably a low vibration that that person's in, you know? So then what is the lesson in the book that we should take away from Marilyn? Isn't it complicated that you do the thing that gets you the most attention and the most... Mm -hmm equity in the marketplace, right? But then you feel, I mean, it's very similar to the mom who's doing the job that's mm -hmm. the most important job, but feels like they're yeah. not important, mm -hmm. right? Isn't it the same? I mean, I think the lesson is you can't give up one for the other. You have to be everything. And I don't mean that in a pressured way, like you have to be everything for everyone else. Like for myself, yes, I was the mom and that was the role, especially at the time with young children. But, you know, I'm also me still. 
and I was a self before I had them. And I've talked to them about this, actually, that, you know, I was a person for a while before I had you guys. I didn't just come into the world when you did as your mom, you know? And I think it's important to remember that. You have to still be who you are and not separate yourself. Are there any other lessons in the book? Becoming a self? And like self with a capital S, kind of a self, like a whole self in the world is really hard to do. And it's challenging. And I do think we're sort of charged existentially to do that, but it's not a perfect thing. It's not like you're going to get there and be like, I'm here, you know, I'm done. I think we're always growing and learning. And there's so many complicated factors at play in our existence. And so just trying trying, just trying. <laughs> trying is something, you know, because a lot of times people don't even feel like they can try. So. Yeah. I, I personally think that uh, fame is an interesting thing because for me, sometimes people have this perception mm -hmm. that is very singular uh -huh. and that they've filled in a bunch of blanks and made a bunch of assumptions I mean, in a way, if, if we're honest, if somebody idolizes you or sees you as some sort of figure that mm -hmm. is famous in their, their world, they are in a way saying you're more important. Your opinion carries more value. You're, uh, yeah, you're the expert, right? And that's an, <laughs> that's an odd uh, responsibility yeah. that they're imposing. You're not asking for it. You're not saying I'm smarter than you or... Right. But if you wanted to have a conversation, the context of the conversation is that your opinion has more weight than theirs, which is an odd sort of thing, right? Yeah, definitely. And I think, I mean, there's power dynamics is what you're talking about, really, and unintended power. But they're giving it to you. You're not asking for it. Right. I'm not asking. I'm not no, asking. No, that's why it's unintended. It. Like, you're not going out there saying, hey, everyone, I'm the best. You all need to shut up and listen to me, right? Right. So it's unintended. But there is this power dynamic. And then it feels kind of weird because you're like, oh. Well, it feels really weird when people <laughs> fill in blanks and they see you as a singular thing. Yes, and I think that is definitely what Marilyn experienced. And I think that is largely the experience of being a woman too, just in general. Whether you're, you're attractive, you're too attractive, what are you trying to do? Why do you need so much attention? Oh, well, you're not that attractive. Why don't you try harder? Um, you're a bitch, you don't smile. I just said hi, why can't you say hi back? You know, there's all this kind of stuff. It's, it's weird. <laughs> it is. Don't you find that the best course is just to ignore all that and just be yourself? Yeah, but I think you have, you have to learn that. It takes a long time yeah. to learn. No. And there's a lot of heartache in the process. Definitely. Definitely. So you're still 23 when you finish the book? Uh, yeah, I mean, I probably read it really fast. I read pretty fast, so... Yeah. What changes in you from before you opened the book to when you closed it? What are what are the changes? I mean, I honestly felt like it's so immersive because she she even uses first person and second person points of view. So sometimes the way that the writing is, it's like you walk into a room, you see X Y Z happen. So the narration, it's just very like it gets inside your head. You're like experiencing it in a really intense way. I feel like dazed by reading it. Like it's, it's frantic and it's very energetic. And I don't know, I've read it a few times since the first time. And every time I open it up, I just feel like, oh my God, like, you know, like, uh, it's just a lot. It's just a lot. I don't know if anything particularly changed immediately. I think it had to sink in. It was a lot to digest. So what sinks in? I mean, I think one is like, there's a validation, right? There's like, oh my God, like somebody has had and written about this experience. And Joyce Carol Oates writes often about the experiences of women, about the complicated relationship between a woman's body and herself and being a mother and, you know, all of these things. She writes a lot about these themes, like throughout a lot of her work. So I wasn't necessarily surprised. This just really, it just really hit a nerve. 
really strongly. Does it, did anything change though in the way you approached life? Eventually, I got a divorce, and eventually, <laughs> I lived on my own for a long time, and eventually, I got I'm married again now, and it's all very, very different. So I think it was part of that journey of realizing, like, yes, I created the life that I was in, but I created it almost under, like, in bad faith with myself. I didn't create it in good faith with myself. And what caused the bad faith? Oh, just, you know what you're expected to do and being afraid of who you are underneath and not So not being to authentic to yourself? Yeah, basically. And kind of just following the plan? Yeah, for sure. That's a big part of it. I, I don't know, and it's hard to say. Like, I can't maybe even explain fully how, and it's even embarrassing to say, like, how afraid I was of who I was. And it's not because I'm a bad person, you know? It's not because I was going to murder somebody. It's just because I didn't think that I was allowed to be that. Yeah. Yeah. That makes that makes sense. Yeah. I feel like now I'm doing that. Nobody can tell. I can tell. <laughs> no one else can tell per se, you know? It's not like you're sitting here with me going like, oh, yeah, I know all her internal secrets and all the darkest parts of who she is and embraces. You know, you're not, you're just, we're just talking, right? But like I know who I'm being. Oh, I I would bet that we could tell. Like <laughs> in the sense that uh, oh, no. you bring <laughs> you bring a certain energy to a room that is collaborative, it's positive, it's uh accepting. Thank you. And I would I would guess you can tell me that if we went back in time, there would be a, the energy would be a little edgier. It would be a little shorter. It wouldn't be as collaborative. Yes, I think you're right about that. I mean, that's a big deal when you can when you can walk into a room and you feel authentic. Your energy is contagious because people feel comfortable around people that are comfortable. Yeah. See, and I think that's the difference maybe between some kind of attention that maybe you know Marilyn got or even that I feel like I got when I was young, it wasn't based on like some authentic expression of a whole person. It was based on this narrow kind of stereotype of like however people perceived me. And so it felt uncomfortable. Whereas now it does feel much more like, oh, like, yes, I can come in here and be like this. And like, you know, it feels more empowered, so. You know who's a good example of that to me is Maria Abramovich. She does things that are, you yes. know, sexualized and different, like some pretty, some pretty crazy Very stuff. Subversive stuff, yeah. Yeah, she's very authentic. And so yeah. you don't even see it as that. It's not, it's not like she's playing a role of, being yeah. sexy or being this or being that. And so there's a different energy to what she does. Yeah. And no, I think I think right. that is the energy I'm trying to describe is that it's oh. it's more human, I guess, and more authentic. Does that make sense? Definitely. I would hope to be there, you know? So it's nice. You think you're closer yeah. than you think. <laughs> Thanks. No, that's really nice. I do think I've grown a lot as a person. I mean, this novel is a novel I picked for this. I think a lot of books have come into play for me in my life. And being validated by other people's experiences, realizing like I'm not alone in these experiences, that there are other people who are living in the way that maybe I would aspire to. And that I'm like, well, they're doing it so I can do it, you know, and you kind of start to evolve yourself. And I think that is what I've done. When you were a young mother, you're also helping a lot of people through your practice. So that is true. In a way, it's it's from the same kind of uh, spectrum of helping others become the best versions of themselves, just like raising kids or? That is very true. When I initially went to school to become a therapist, I wanted to specialize in sex therapy. You don't get like a specialty degree. You just get the license and then you can specialize in if you want. But I was too scared. So I didn't. I went and did internships in schools and I worked with kids and I love kids and I love working with kids, so I don't regret it. And then I just did general therapy for a long time. And then at some point, right around when I'm realizing so many things in my life, I was like, it's probably my Saturn return actually, now that I think about it. But um, I was like, I'm going to go to school again to do the sex therapy certification. So I did. And that's what I do now. So anyway, it's kind of part of the whole journey, you know? 
was realizing like the thing I was afraid to do, I'm like, I can do that. And I just have to be like, yes, this is what I'm doing. When are you going to write a book? Oh, yeah, I don't know. No, you haven't question. thought about it? I have thought about it. I've been asked. People have told me. I have a really, I have a lot of weird life stories, Chris. <laughs> Since well, I was pretty I'm sure young. <laughs> some of the stories that you hear in your practice are maybe as weird, if not more. Oh, yeah. I love, I, that's my favorite thing about being a therapist is how nosy you get to be and you get paid for it. Like I get to find out everything about anyone, you know, that's sitting in front of me if they want to share it. No, there's no pressure, right? But no, it's amazing. Pe well, everyone, people are fascinating. Yes. And you have no idea what anyone has been through. Anyone. You just have no clue. And it's amazing. Well, and there's two things. It's what they've been through and then how they perceived what they've been through. Well, totally. And the, that, yeah. that play is fascinating to me. And then when people are in therapy, a lot of the time, it's because they're trying to do that second thing. They're trying to figure out how to integrate what they've been through into who they are and moving forward in a way with themselves, you know, that isn't just stuck with stuck in the stuff that happened to them. But I do think that sexuality is an integral part to becoming a full person. And your adult sexual relationships are the places to grow yourself up as a human. And a lot of times people will neglect that step or they're not sure why it's not working. And, you know, it's really cool thing to talk about with people. Okay, in closing, any other thoughts on the book? Oh, Blonde. I think men should read this book. I think this book maybe appeals more to women because it's about Marilyn Monroe and it's written by a woman or whatever. Um, I think men could learn a lot from understanding something like what this book is trying to convey about the sort of conflict sometimes between someone who is something on the outside and maybe something different on the inside. Yeah, I would assume that men could learn more <laughs> because... Just period. <laughs> well, no, it's just a, from a female's perspective, reading the book, you relate to it, but men would, would learn a perspective that you're not familiar with. Yes, yes. I recommend it to everyone. My best friend Ashley has read it on my recommendation and just rocked her world as well, just psychologically, you know. Like Was her take different than yours? Mm, I mean, very similar, I would say. I think we understood it in really similar ways. But yeah, I don't know. Maybe she would have a few different things to say. <laughs> well, I love talking to you. Thank you for talking to me. I always learn me. something. Thank Cheers. you so much. Thank you. Do we eat the cherry? Um, I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>